Thank you, Brother Mason, and good evening, everybody, and thanks for coming to hear this uh, important section of God's Word that, uh, in fact, that was printed and given by our Lord Jesus Christ to us. Just a little bit of uh, shopkeeping. Now, Mason did give a very good suggestion before the meeting is that, but seeing that we've got some that's actually forward, we'll put it into action, is that another ecclesia they actually put the rostrum halfway back because everyone was at the back. But it's, uh, we've got a bit of a spread here this, this evening. So what we've got this evening, our subject is about the Lord's Prayer. Probably everybody, um, meaning everybody in society, even non-believing uh, people in the Word of God would probably know the Lord's Prayer. Um, probably most people could recite the Lord's Prayer. So it's well known, but how many people actually know what the Lord's Prayer is all about? So it is the Lord's Prayer. And what we're going to see tonight that is extremely well structured words that our Lord Jesus Christ gives to us. So when we read it, why did he actually uh, came, uh, come up with the words that he came up with? And the answer is seen somewhat in the previous verses is from verse 8. <coughs> in another place in Luke 11, the disciples actually asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. And so that was one of the things that caused him to do it. But this is, these are some of the other comments that are here. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But they are when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of, before you ask him. So there are a few of the things that our Lord addressed before he actually gave us the words that he then uh, shows to us. So verse 5 we learn that prayer is not a performance. Prayer is not there given to... Uh, show everybody just how good you are and how many words you can say and uh, as it shows that in verse 5. It shows that prayer is a private, personal interaction with God. Unless we come together in, in common worship, of course, is that then as the uh, chairman has done, prays on our behalf before God. But commonly, prayer is given in our homes and things like that and therefore it is a private, personal interaction with God. Verse 7 teaches us it's not for vain repetition. God doesn't want to hear a babble of word, meaningless words said over and over and over again. They are of no interest to him. And verse 8 says that God knows what we have need of so we do not need to endlessly tell God what we need in that sense. He knows what we have need of. He wants us to be tuned in a certain way in our thought patterns. And if you notice all those verses that the emphasis is on the person that's praying is them. It's about what they are doing. But the whole idea of the Lord's Prayer is not about ourselves but what God has done for us. 
and what we should be doing for God. So Jesus gave his disciples a pattern prayer. This is a pattern Is that, is that right? Pattern. Spell it that way. That do, Russ. <coughs> it's a pattern prayer or a template prayer. It's so a person can structure a meaningful and a God honouring prayer in their own words. It's a structure by which we use. It is not meant to be a prayer that you just recite, recite, recite. There's no value in that because, uh, as I'll show you in a minute, is that, uh, well, verse 9, I'll just go through this. Verse 9 says, After this manner, it's not meant to be just used by itself. After this manner, or after this, excuse me, after this way is the way that you are to, to pray. Now, if you was here listening to the excerpt this morning, I said actually to Brother Steve, I said, I don't really need to speak tonight. Maybe we'll just put your excerpt back on because Timothy was a living expression of that prayer if you was listening this morning Timothy is actually a living expression of the prayer and this is what the prayer is about a live, us being a living expression of the words that are used in the prayer now contrasted to that is say for instance what they do in parliament now I googled this because I just wanted to make sure the facts were right <coughs> But Parliament, for instance, use the Lord's Prayer every, time, every day that they sit and have so done since Federation, which was 1901. So how many Lord's Prayers do you think that's been done along the way? And then, if you listen to Parliament, it is so opposite to anything that is actually said in that prayer. It's not God-honouring. <coughs> it is not forgiving one another. It is not looking for a kingdom. It is not giving expression to praise to God. It's an endless repetition of words that mean nothing. So that's where we need to be very careful in how we use these words. In fact, the apostles who received the words, because these words were given to his disciples, they were not just given to everybody, they said, how shall we pray? Jesus said, use this pattern. So the apostles received it and are never recorded as using it in that way just as it's written. They saw that their lives had to be expression of those words and not as a repetition prayer. The prayer expresses a close relationship and a trust and we're going to see that. A close relationship and a trust is broken into three sections. So I'm just going to put a line down here. It's going to be three sections that we're going to have. And then each one of those is going to be three points. So it's an extremely well thought out words that our Lord uses. In verse 9 it says, Our Father. So it starts off, Our Father. Who art in heaven. So we find from that, if we're used to use an expression, Our Father, then in looking the other way, we must be his children. So it is a form of words that indicates that we are the children of God because we think like God, we act like God. So there is, there is a likeness. 
So we express him as our father, as a child would their father. There's the likeness, there's the family association. So it is a very intimate type of relationship that is brought up in these words. So what does it suggest to us? That we're part of a family. And how are we part of a family? We know from the scriptures those that have associated themselves with Christ are in Christ and therefore they also are brethren in Christ and therefore they are part of the family name. So when we believe the truth and we're baptised, we take on God's name in our spiritually, in our lives. Also addressing him as our father is addressing him with due respect. We're showing respect to our father. It's showing to us also by using the expression that we want to be associated with him. And also, you know, you see little children or or playing or something and dad's doing something and the child is imitating their dad. They just want to be like their dad. And it's an expression that actually comes out in this that we want to be like our father. John chapter 8. Let's just have a look at John chapter 8. just absorb these, it's from a little bit of a different angle, but then comes back to the point. Starting from verse 37. (coughs) I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. And now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Ye do the works of your father. Then said they to him, Oh, we don't be born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. And Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? So we find in those expressions that Jesus actually deals with the idea of what it is to be a father as to be like him to be associated with him and the other thing is the father is in heaven now that gives a different dimension again he's in heaven so he's our father but there is a recognition of his position So we cannot overstep our relationship with him. So your earthly fathers, or whatever, um, may respect or not respect. We may do things that displease or whatever. But with God, he cannot be brought down to our level. He is our father, which is in heaven, and he says, if you approach me, you approach me from that particular angle. You approach me with respect from where I am. I am your father. So this commences the first section. The first section and the first one is hallowed. It's a funny expression I suppose that we wouldn't even use today in our vernacular but it means to make holy. To 
to make holy. So hallowed be thy name. So to make holy. God is holy, so it does not mean him. It means that to children speaking to him and addressing him as our father are to be like him by action and by thinking. Action, by purifying and cleansing ourselves is what the uh, Strong's Concordance gives the idea of hello and uh, consecrating oneself or setting apart oneself to God and the idea of consecrating is actually to fill one's hands completely up. Now the expression of that is if you fill your hands up completely with giving thanks and respect to God there's not room for anything else to come out of your hand because your hands are full. So it gives the idea that we're uh, uh, consecrating oneself to fill our hands with giving God the praise. We need to also put this into our thinking by venerating God, which is the other part of what Strong's Concordance tells us the word actually means. And venerating God means to have profound respect for God. Interesting, Leviticus chapter 10 verse 3 says this, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. So you can see from the words that is recorded in Leviticus, from the point of view that God says, this is how you approach me, then if we approach God as a father, that's how we will approach him. So we find that it's about just the point here, name. The name. We all have family names. As I said, when we are baptised in Christ we take on his family name. Now, what does a name express? Now, uh, in another talk of recently is given an expression about a name. The name today is that they're just our names and actually a lot of names have, do have an origin. might be in a, in a uh, how a person's blacksmith or something like that and it, com- it comes through even into our time. But always in the Old Testament a name represented something. It represented who the people actually were. So when we're talking about the name of God, it's talking about the actual who God is. It speaks of his plan and his purpose. It speaks of his character. It speaks what he stands for. So you might remember the statement that Moses said, well what shall I tell the people? What is your name? And the whole idea of the expression of that was, If I give the people your name, they'll understand what you're all about. So that's why the expression is, hallowed be thy name. It identifies the plan and the purpose and the character and who God really is. Now if we're addressing our Father, we understand what that name is representing. Thy name, in other words then, in that expression, is thy name is to be kept holy. Hallowed be thy name. And it's be kept holy by the members of the family that address him as our Father, by what we do and by what we think. So his purpose will be fulfilled. The uh, second one is thy kingdom come. So what does that raise in our minds if we were addressing God? Thy kingdom come. It means that there is a kingdom to come. 
And it also means that there is a kingdom to come and there the kingdom we want to come is used in those expressions. So we need to ask the question, I guess, in, in using those words, are we really looking for the kingdom to come? Do we know what the kingdom is that is to come? Now I'd say that most of us could rattle off the top of our heads some quotes that would give us about the kingdom coming. It'd be like Daniel 2, Ezekiel 38, 39, there be Isaiah 2, Zechariah 14 and a host of others that we'd be able to talk about the kingdom coming. And to show that the kingdom will come and will centre from Jerusalem and Christ as king. We often give lectures in that regard and talk about Christ coming back and from Jerusalem it will happen. Zechariah 14 and all the rest of them. But I want to look at around Jesus' birth. Just look at a different perspective and you'll know these as well from Luke. Turn to Luke chapter 1. (coughs) So from the very beginning of when Jesus was to be born and is born is very clear as to what it's all about in regards to this kingdom. And so we read from (coughs) Luke chapter 1 and verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, which means that God shall save. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest, And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So there's a very clear message of what all those other chapters we've been talking about in the Old Testament prophecies and what this kingdom is to come. And it was to come through Lord Jesus Christ. We know that David reigned upon a throne in Israel. He's going to get that throne. He's going to reign over the house of Jacob. The house of Jacob is Israel. So that gives the territory by which it's going to happen. So we then turn over to chapter 2. And his birth takes place. And this is what we read. (coughs) Verse 13. And suddenly there was the angel with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill toward men. Now that's an expression that's given because of this child that has been born. Now shortly they will be words that's going to be used quite a lot. Glory to God in the highest and peace and on earth peace and goodwill toward men through Christmas that's celebrated in the world. You see, glory to God and all those things can only happen when verses 30 to 33 of the first chapter are fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Then there will be peace and goodwill toward men when that happens. So we go on to verse 25. He's brought into the temple according to um, uh, verse 23. And as it is written, the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And so they had to come to the temple and, and offer a sacrifice. And it says, verse 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was a just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so he saw him and then he was happy with that and said, Now I can fall to sleep. 
And then we go to verse 38. We find also that there's another person, Anna, who was a prophetess. And she coming in that instant, giving thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake, to, spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Israel. So this was this expectation at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ, that he should be the one that would come to be the one through whom the promise of the seed would come, who would then establish this kingdom. And this is the kingdom that the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about, that he's going to be the one that will establish that. So it's very interesting that it was very much established at the time of before his birth and at the time of his birth. Now it says also, as the third part, thy will will be done in earth as in heaven. That reinforces the first statement that God's will is going to be done in the earth as it is in the heavens at this point. So in our prayer to God we are asking for God's will to be done. We're not asking for my will or your will or a government's will to be done but God's will to be done. His principles, his values, his ways are the only ones that can be established. Come to Isaiah chapter 2. It was a chapter that I used, uh, talked about before but we'll go there and have a look from this point of view. Isaiah chapter 2 from verse 2 which is going to establish the words that Jesus said in this particular part above it. And he says, And it shall come to pass in the last days. And we know when the Bible talks about last days, latter days, we're talking about the time when the Lord Jesus Christ will come again into the earth. That the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And so Isaiah says to, to them there exactly what's being suggested here. So he says to the people back then, to which the words then are projected to us today and also those in Jesus' time, is that, O house of Jacob, or whoever's listening to this, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. In that way, we can truly be associated with our Father. So we find then that we come to the next section, the middle section here, and it says the first part is give us our daily bread. It's an interesting expression to actually say that. He doesn't say give us comfortable life, 50 years of supplies 
or anything else like that. He's saying to us that we need to think about our daily bread. It is not a demand or expectation of prosperity or what we want. Unfortunately today in our society what we need and what we want is, gets mixed up. Give us this day, that is today, sufficient to live. Why? Why does he put it that way? Surely there's tomorrow and the next day and so forth. It should cause us to ask and thank God each and every day. That's the point he's making. Every day that we come and ask God. So what's that teaching us? It's teaching us that we need to be dependent on God. Not to be think that we can just take God for granted or what he gives for granted. But each and every day, and that's why we will give, say, thanks for our meals and thank God for them. We're giving thanks for the daily bread. See, we need to be careful that we don't uh, we don't try in our lives to satisfy our wants because we may think we are very clever and very very uh, uh, prosperous or whatever we think in life but God in an instant he can take from us the ability to satisfy our wants so we should be very careful and think about our daily bread. Psalm 37 verse 25 says this put that there says this I have been young and am old yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. God will always provide. Our next part is this. Forgive. I'll shorten this. Our debts. Um, as we forgive others their debts. Now, in, um, in Luke chapter 11, it talks about that debts actually means sins. So we're dead as to God because we sin. But also, if we uh, just to look in um, <coughs> Matthew chapter 6, the next few verses actually talk to us of those points. It says this, Verse 14 For if we forgive men their trespasses your heavenly Father will also forgive you but if ye forgive not men their trespasses neither will your Father forgive your trespasses So if we are to seek repentance or want repentance from God for things that we do amiss we also got to be in like kind as to be able to forgive others theirs. Now we need to think about this in relation to that is this. There has to be a recognition of sin. You can't repent for something if you don't recognise what the problem is. There has to be a recognition of our sin on the one hand with a need for repentance from that sin. And there has to be also on the other hand a need to forgive others by recognition of sin. There's no point in forgiving others just because you forgive them. There always has to be a recognition of sin. Put it this way. In Luke chapter 23, verse 34, it says this. As Jesus 
who had hung upon a cross and went through all those terrible atrocities. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So Jesus was asking his Father to forgive them. He didn't excuse the sin. The sin has to be apparent. But he could forgive them. What that means then, is that then free for the person that's been forgiven? No. And if they want forgiveness, then they must acknowledge their sin. So it's a two-way path. The third point here, on this section here, is, talks about temptation. Just abbreviate that. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, that can be, this can be a very complex statement. Temptation actually is a very bad translation of what the idea really is. See, God allows us to go through trials that are not of his doing, God does not set us up. But he allows us to go through trials to build our characters to be more like him. James chapter 1 13 to 14 says this in relation to that. That no man, no one say when passing through trial, and this is from a different translation, My temptation is from God, for God is incapable of being tempted to do evil and he himself tempts no one. So that brings that idea into uh, into context of what he's actually meaning here. And 1 Corinthians 10 says this, There hath no temptation or trial taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with the temptation also make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So why do these things come upon us? These things come upon us in life because if nothing came upon us there would be no transformation of our character to be like our God. We'd be very self-centred and very satisfied, thanks very much because everything works out for us. But So things come on us in life. A lot of things, as James talks about, they actually bring upon <coughs> ourselves. And so we need to understand that these are not things from God but he allows them to happen so we might learn the lessons from it. And so we find that we come to uh, the last section. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Kingdom, power and glory. So in our prayer to our Father we are recognising that God, that the kingdom is God's and that it is us who have to conform to his way, to his kingdom. It's not our ways that need to be enforced upon him. Thine is the power. We are recognised that God has the power and ability to perform whatever he chooses. If he made the earth in seven days, he made the earth in seven days. If he parted the Red Sea, he parted the Red Sea. Whatever he has said and he has done, that is God's power and ability to do so. (coughs) Why don't you come just quickly to Psalm 145. Now this is an interesting psalm because actually it's not a bad simile of the Lord's Prayer.
it is a fairly well structured prayer similar to the Lord's Prayer. <coughs> For instance, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day I will bless thee and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. <coughs> Doesn't that express all those first ideas that uh, are shown in there? Then we come to verse 10. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee and thou givest them their meat in due season. Can you see the actual ideas of, this, uh, of uh, the Lord's Prayer coming out here? The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him to all them that call upon him in truth. He will fulfil the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. And that's the whole idea of this prayer. is a prayer to God to bring about those things that he has said concerning his kingdom and our involvement in it. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy my mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name for ever and ever. And I think those words probably summarise pretty much uh, the Lord's prayer as our Lord gave it. Thine is the glory. We know from time and time again when we have lectures we talk about Numbers 14.21. Thine is the glory. The earth will be filled with his glory meaning those that have embraced his ways, his thinking, are now changed and have become his children to his glory. His children give him glory. Jesus said in John 14 verse 9, He that have seen me have seen the Father, and how sayest thou showest the Father? In the kingdom that is, that is how it will be for us as we go with the gospel to the world. That is what we are called to emulate now. That people could see us and look at us and say, I see the Father. I look at this person, but I see the expression of the Father in that person. You can see the family resemblance. And so God is honoured when that prayer is made. And it ends there in Amen as the final part of that. Amen. Now that expression is it's a number of ideas that it represents. It represents so be it. We agree it is so and it will happen. That's the idea of an Amen. We agree totally with all those words that have been spoken. We agree that God is right in all those things that he has said and we can then say, Amen, let it happen. And so what remains for us is to embrace the full import of this prayer. Make it our life and we shall be part of God's family. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Steele, and I'm a Christadelphian, and I've been one for pretty well all my adult life. 
you're probably wanting to know what does the word Christadelphia mean. It simply means brethren of Christ. And we believe that if you want to be a true follower of Christ, you really need to know what this book, the Holy Bible, really does teach. And we would love to have the opportunity to show you what the Christadelphians believe and how it is based on this Bible. We get very excited about the Bible because it foretells uh, the future in such accurate uh, detail, particularly Bible prophecy. And we believe the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is very soon to happen on the face of this earth, particularly when you look at the prophecies regarding the nation of Israel and Russia and Europe and other nations. You'll be fascinated to know what this Bible really does teach about what is going on in our earth today. Um, we would encourage you to have a look at this website that we've put together for you. Uh, it uh, shows you all about the Christadelphians, what we believe, and also what this Bible really does teach. Uh, Christadelphians are what we call a lay movement. That is, nobody gets paid anything. So we're not on a recruitment drive whatsoever to get more Christadelphians. We simply want you to understand what this book really does teach and have the opportunity to search out the matter for yourself. So enjoy our website. It talks all about uh, the Bible. It talks about our beliefs. And it even has uh, some of the seminars that we, we do quite often in our halls. So uh, enjoy it. And uh, if you need to contact us at any time, please do so through the website site and uh, we would be only too pleased to, uh, to be able to talk to you further about these important matters. Thank you very much.